Hello, everybody. I want to thank all of you folks for taking your time out of your busy schedules to come and join us today for our virtual training from Africa Fire Mission. My name is Mike. I'm a project coordinator here with Africa Fire Mission. Uh, and today we're welcoming uh, Chief Frank, uh, Frank Montes de Oca. Uh, he's with us. He's been training with us a, a number of times and does a great job, teaches us a lot about uh, leadership. Today we'll be talking about incident command. Uh, but first, we're going to go over to uh, Jose, Africa Fire Mission's fire safety advocate, for a word of encouragement. Thank you so much, Chief Mike, and uh, thank you so much, Chief Frank, aka Chief Taco. Thank you so <laughs> much for uh, <laughs> showing up, and I uh, truly appreciate you always for finding time to come. I'm really also so excited to see uh, Mr. Indajit. Oh, sorry. sorry. That was my sorry. fault, Jose. I muted you. Go ahead. Oh. oh, thank you so much. I saw you pointing and I knew there's something not right. <laughs> so, yes, and I was saying, uh, I really say thank you. Uh, I recognize the presence of uh, Mr. Indajit Main uh, Singh. Thank you for finding time, sir. I truly appreciate you. Uh, today, um, my, the, the word of an encouragement today was just basically, um, I was just waking up today morning and I felt uh, that I need to encourage us on uh, us really practicing, you know? You know, sometimes you can be practicing on, absolute, uh, on anything you, you are, you are uh, engaging in. And when you're practicing, you, you fail, you don't succeed, you fail a lot. So currently what I'm doing, I have this uh, Ruby cube that I'm really trying to, to learn, put all the yellows on one side, the reds on the other side. And it's really frustrating me. I'm like, oh, why am I not getting it? So there's another movie I saw on Netflix that this guy just does it in, in about seven seconds. <laughs> seven seconds. I mean, I'm taking like three hours. So I, I encourage myself. I'm like, you know what, Jose? When you practice every day, every day you might take 10 hours reduce it to nine and a half hours and you don't know one time you'll just be doing the seven seconds so back to you in the sense that whatever you're engaging is it driving is it cooking is it communication skills is it a making new friends yeah don't get tired keep on doing what you're doing and don't feel like you're a failure because you will fail yourself to success. Do not stop that you're failing. Fail yourself to success, even though it means dragging yourself there. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chief Mike. Thank you, Jose. Thanks for those uh, words of encouragement. Uh, next week, we'll do an online training with my son. He's 12 and he can solve the Rubik's Cube. So we'll, do a, we'll let him lead the training and teach you all uh, how to do that. <laughs> All right, uh, we're ready to go here today with our training about incident command. I'm going to pass it over to Chief Frank. Uh, I've got you on mute there, so be sure to unmute yourself first there, Chief. Uh, take it away. There we go. Well, thank you so much to everyone. Uh, Jose, that, those are great words of encouragement. Uh, I've owned a couple of Rubik's Cubes, and they've always ended up in the trash can because after a while, my frustration level is either I throw them in the trash can for someone else to try or uh, they become pieces of plastic. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and and that's, that's interesting that you, that you talk about, about tr testing yourself and trying yourself and trying and trying. Uh, incident command becomes, uh, if you, when you do it, I, I shouldn't say when you do it enough, but when you uh, go to the same types of calls day in and day out, um, it becomes almost uh, mental mu muscle memory of what we're going to go through today. I'm going to talk about incident command uh, the first 10 minutes, because I think that's where the foundational process of a good incident command uh, structure and, and on, online or ongoing process uh, occurs. So, Let's get started. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work. Why is it not working for me? 
Let's see if this works. There we go. Let's try that. Okay, so today what we're going to cover is a uh, scene size up, uh, looking at the, the entire picture and trying to focus uh, some of the mental skills that, that we need in our, in our incident command toolbox that we can uh, put into play. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later on about this, this structure fire that was uh, the largest structure fire that I had experienced in my, my career after about 25 years. And uh, we'll see if, that, if uh, we can cover that. We'll talk a little bit about communications, how important that is to communicate with the on ground, uh, on scene uh, folks, and also with the incoming mutual aid folks and, and uh, those, those players. Uh, we, we wouldn't be uh, doing ourselves a, a, a favor if we didn't talk about safety. So we'll talk about firefighter uh, and, and civilian safety, the, the victims uh, that, that we have to protect as well. And lastly, if we have time, we'll cover what I call incident command truisms, things that, that uh, we know occurs during events. And if we were to take, take mental note of those and to react to them or to proact to them, uh, we'll be successful in our incident command. So let's move on. So if we're ready, uh, I don't know how this dog slipped in here, but uh, the message is if we're ready, let's get going. Many of the, the calls that firefighters respond to, building fires and medical emergencies, entrapments, and so forth, uh, you have to uh, take into account all the incident command tools that we'll talk about throughout uh, this, this hour or so, or 45 minutes or so. And so we can apply them to all different kinds of incidents that we will. Uh, we'll be uh, working on. Let me see if I can get this guy out of the way. There we go. All right, whoops. Uh, I'm getting, a, there we go. Let's see if we can, there we go. All right, we're having some difficulties here. So there we go. So let's talk about the size up. Size up is, is critical. If we don't have a good foundation, just like when you're building a, uh, your home or building a structure, if you don't have a good foundation, then that home is going to, uh, over time, crumble or, or break or, or collapse. And so our incident command process, we need to get started in a strong fashion. And the first thing I'll talk about is pre-incident planning. Your size up should start months, weeks, maybe days before the event even occurs. And what I mean by that is developing a process where we uh, go out in, into our community and we develop a, an inventory of our target hazards. Now, uh, a real quick and down and dirty uh, definition of a target hazard is any occupancy or structure or complex that either has a large uh, uh, potential for uh, fire growth and fire loading or has a large potential for um, uh, vi uh, multiple victims uh, in, in the event of, of a fire or, or an emergency occurrence. So if you have the ability within your, I, I, I heard uh, Chief Mike and, and Jose, I heard you all talking about going into the community to develop some fire prevention uh, activities and efforts, which is extremely commendable. Part of that process may be to develop an inventory of those structures, those buildings, those businesses that might have the potential for a large fire or large event occurring, getting out of hand, if you will, or a large amount of victims if a fire were to occur there. Develop those target hazards, whether they're schools or hospitals or large uh, industrial complexes that uh, maybe employ a lot of people that if that, if that uh, complex were to catch fire and to go out of business would cause a lot of stress within that community. So once again, incident size up starts prior to the arrival of our incident. And when we get on the scene, when we arrive on the scene, one of the most common things that fire commanders will do is to do what we call a 360 rotation around the building. Uh, a lot of people will do just what we call a 270, which means as you approach the scene, uh, you'll see the, uh, the D side or the, or the right side of the structure. As you go past the building a little bit, you'll see the front side or the A side. And then as you go past maybe a little further, you'll see the B side. Uh, what I would uh, recommend is that we go, if we can, if we have time, and if we have the ability to go around the entire structure, get a real good eyeball picture of what's going on with that structure, make a mental, make a mental <laughs> note of where our exits are, make a mental note of where the, uh, the windows are, and maybe some other uh, issues that we want to be concerned with, such as are there fuel tanks or other fire load concerns within that structure on the outside of that structure. 
And also incident size up includes our previous experience. Uh, what I call that is our, our mental hard drive. Uh, oftentimes, if you see a fire that looks very similar to a, a fire you might have gone to uh, the week before, or the month before, uh, many, many times you can, you can utilize the same skills and the same actions to uh, bring that fire under control. And lastly, for incident size up, I would talk a little bit about operational guidelines or your standard operating procedures or your policies when you, when you approach the fire incident. Uh, if you have good operational guidelines that are updated regularly and that are, are enforced with all of our firefighters, then typically your incident size up will be uh, well structured. All right. <clears throat> Why are we not? Let's see if we can do that. There we go. Okay, so information upon arrival. <clears throat> so the information that determines our strategy, the strategy which is the big picture of what we want to do with this incident, is the building construction, the occupancy oh, use, meaning uh, what is that structure? What is that building being used for? Is, is it a school? I mean, are there a lot of students in there? Is it in, an industrial or a business there that has maybe a lot of workers in there? Is it some place that is developing uh, some uh, hazardous materials that you need to be concerned about? We want to we want to consider the number of potential victims, the location of the of the body of the fire. Where is the actual um, basis of the fire that's there? Is it in the actual inside of the building? Is it on the outside of the structure? Has it, has it gotten into the roof line or into the attic area and spread, spread throughout the building? Or is it now starting to impinge upon uh, of the exposures outside the building? What type of exit pathway blockage are, are we seeing or are we uh, assuming when we uh, gather that information upon our arrival? And I just mentioned a second ago about the exposures and what resources do we have to come into play? Do we have sufficient number of fire engines, of tankers perhaps? Do we have the ability to have laddering capabilities so that if we have a structure that's over perhaps uh, the second floor, we can access the roof if necessary? So these are all the information uh, uh, pieces that we need to put together for the puzzle upon arrival. What type of fire extension are we seeing? In, this, in, the, in the fire you see to the right, I, I think most of you will see the picture to the right. Um, someone give me a, hand, a, a thumbs up if you see the structure uh, picture on the, on the right. Okay, very good. So that's a typical, what we would call a strip mall. Uh, my sense is in, in, in some of your cities, many of your cities, you'll have a similar type of setting where you have maybe two or three or more businesses in one area. You might even have some people living above that, and we'll talk about that in a few slides later on. But what we wanna look at is the fire extension. In this particular picture, we see a, a very large volume of fire in the back of, of the building. And to the upper right, we also see a, 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 an orange glow. So that tells us immediately that we have a lot of fire in the back of the building, as well as perhaps it's broken through the, uh, the roof line. We see this, the smoke to the left of that building or the left side of the building, which we would call the AB side or AB corner. <clears throat> and as we see a large volume of that smoke emitting from the, the building, that gives us a pretty good idea of where that fire is starting to build or has already built and moving to. So that gives us a, a lot of indication of where that extension is. Is it in an internal extension, meaning inside the building, or is it in an external extension, meaning is there another building on the left side of the building that might be, uh, might be included in the fire as it progresses? So we look at the fire building, the impacted exposures, any rescue operations that might be taking place or necessary uh, as we put our, our uh, fire forces together, and what other additional resources do we need? Uh, do we have sufficient number of water flow uh, and build it in uh, 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 structural uh, fire, fire flow uh, kept uh, occurring in this, in this event? All right. So very quickly, we'll talk about construction. Um, what type is it? Is it uh, in the bottom right-hand corner of the, of the slide, you'll see uh, what appears to be a warehouse. The building doesn't, need, doesn't appear to be a very uh, heavy structure. Uh, there's steel components, but we have to be concerned with that. Uh, we know between 800 and 1,000 degrees, that steel will start to expand out. And as it gets a little longer, uh, a little hotter than that, the steel will start to fail on us, which will pull the building in, pull the roof down. So if we have internal 
uh, or inside operations going on, the incident commander should be aware of the construction of that of the uh, of the building that we're concerned with. Uh, on the upper right hand uh, of the slide, you'll see a what we call a taxpayer, um, and it's a pretty common in, in a lot of places in uh, older uh, cities within within the United States and probably within the area that uh, that you've seen occasionally, where you have businesses on the bottom of the of the structure and on the top you typically have residential uh, going on. So what does that tell us uh, in the evening? That maybe the, the, the businesses are closed for the evening, but we still have the, the opportunity or the, uh, the problems of perhaps rescue operations during that fire because we have people living above, above the, the, uh, the, the top floor, if you will. So we need to be concerned about the construction type, the building heights, do we have the capability to ladder the building with even ground ladders? Uh, the typical ground ladder, when I was in the fire service years ago, the typical, the longest ground ladder that we would operate would be a 35 foot ground ladder. Now, what does that tell us? Uh, first of all, it tells us it's a very heavy ladder. Uh, it takes uh, several men to have to operate, men and women to operate that. So it's not a quick operation. So if you're on the scene of, of, a, of a fire, that you need to ladder the building and it's a, set, a two or three story building and you have a 35 foot uh, ground ladder, it's gonna take quite a few minutes, which means backing that up several weeks or months, we need to uh, practice with that train with that. Uh, a quick story off to the side, when I was a firefighter in a small community in Florida years ago, um, the fire chief used to have us train with that 35 foot ground ladder every Tuesday evening. Every Tuesday evening, we go to a, uh, a business that allowed us to go on their, on their grounds and we would practice throwing that 35 foot ladder. And it took six of us to do that, but we could do it pretty effectively. But we trained on that every week, which maybe you know, gives you a hint that if you have something like that, which is a, a fairly complex operation, we need to operate and we need to train with that on a regular basis. We'll move on with mixed use occupancy. Like I mentioned, the building on the upper right hand corner is a, is a uh, business on the yeah. bottom and perhaps uh, occupancy of, of living spaces on top. Uh, what kind of fire loading do we have? In the example that I show you on the right hand on the bottom, there are a lot of boxes on the floor. There's some moving carts and trolleys there. So that fire load cause, causes that fire mm -hmm. to be more extreme in some areas of the building and perhaps not so much in another part. And lastly, we talked about ex exposures, which can also impinge on the construction of that, of, the, of that fire building. So <clears throat> communication is extremely uh, important to uh, the incident commander. Uh, when he or she is calm, is calm, is calm and, and gives the, uh, the, the operational direction, the uh, the scene operates a lot smoother than if the fire commander is excitable, uh, does not use his or her communication systems uh, as effectively as possible. The the issue to talk about is: Do we have a portable radio for every firefighter on the scene? Some departments may have a, a portable radio communication device for every firefighter on the scene, and there are probably some departments that do not. They may have a portable radio uh, just for the on-scene incident commander. So that can change the way that you communicate with your on-the-scene on fire ground uh, operations. Uh, does that mean you have to utilize face-to-face -face communications with your firefighters? In my experience, uh, outside the technology that you might have available to you, there are times when face-to-face -face communications is far superior than, than using your technology, especially if it's in a spotty area where you can't communicate properly. And lastly, the incident commander has to con be concerned with, do our mutual aid companies or departments have the same frequencies of radios when we get to the scene that you can speak to everyone uh, uh, effectively? If not, once again, face-to-face -face communications may be um, the way to, to go uh, and also take in, into consideration the utilization of maybe on scene fire ground um, runners, as I would call them, that can take the the uh, struck the construct the instructions of the incident commander and get them to the field operators around the building around the complex.
occasionally we'll have structural collapse. Now, a structural collapse in and of itself without a fire is, is a complex operation because we, we have to be concerned with the stability of the structure itself of the building. We have to be concerned with the possibility of victims inside. And if the, if the structure collapses while we're doing operations, we also have to be concerned with the possibility of firefighters entrapped and rescuers entrapped as well. So we wanna look at the primary fire building. Uh, if we see signs of smoke coming out of cracks of, of, the, of the walls of the building, do we see some parts of the building starting to sag? Has the roof already uh, collapsed into the building? That can give us uh, telltale signs of a potential collapse of that structure. So we have to look at the, of, of that, that event occurring. Uh, the term collapse zone, uh, many fire departments use that. It's typically one and a half uh, times the height of the building. So if you have a building that's, at, let's say a two-story building that's 20 feet high, then the collapse zone would be about 30 feet. Well, what does that mean? That means if we are on the scene, we pull up on the scene and we see a fire that's well involved in the building and the potential for collapse is there, whether it's just pieces of the building or uh, the whole facade of a building itself, then we want to consider uh, a, a 20 story, excuse me, a 20 foot building or two story building of uh, placing our apparatus 30 feet away from that building so that whatever falls off that building uh, doesn't uh, impede our operations and also expose our firefighters and ourselves and our equipment to uh, falling members of the building and, and uh, damaging or, or hurting our, our folks. So it, it impinges on our apparatus placement. It also, uh, as a fire engine commander, you wanna be concerned with any rescue needs that might occur and any mutual aid, uh, uh, calling of mutual aid uh, forces when that collapse starts to, to occur. So structural collapse is a, a very common uh, event at, at many large fires or heavy fires. And so we also, so we need to be concerned about uh, structural collapse. Let me see if I can clear my screen. There we go. Okay. So what effect does weather have? Well, <clears throat> as, as you all very well know in, in, in Africa and uh, we're, we're experiencing it all over the country here in the United States and, and typically all over the world, the temperatures are, are starting to grow hotter and hotter in the summer months. And now they're starting to grow warmer in, in, the, other, in the other seasons as well. Well, the temperatures can affect a lot of things. First and, and foremost, as I spoke, uh, I guess a couple months ago, we talked about rehabbing our firefighters. And so the, the need to, to rehabilitate our firefighters, let them uh, rotate out of the, of the firefighting operation, sit in an area that's a little quieter, give them some refreshments, some water, or some Gatorade or anything that might replenish their, the, their hydration, and let them cool off a bit. Uh, the temperature at your fire scene is probably the, the foremost uh, concern that you would have when we talk about weather. Now, if we have a, 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 a thunderstorm that occurs, maybe not on the scene, but maybe in the hills near us, we need to be concerned about, do we have flash flooding in that particular area? Do we have a lot of rain runoff that might impede our firefighters, might put them in danger, put the civilians that are, that were, are rescuing or self-rescuing out, and we might have put them in a, in a holding area or staging area to, to care for them. We have to be concerned with uh, any rain or runoff, any high winds that might impede or impact the structure that's already been, uh, been destabilized by the fire. Uh, obviously lightning, if you have that in the area, we need to make sure that if we have roof operations, we need to get our folks off the roof and get them uh, in, in, a, in a safe working area. So these are some of the things that we need to be aware of and concerned with when we talk about uh, weather, and we're uh, considering that when we do our operations in our uh, in our firefighting operations. Let's see if we can get this one going. There we go. So there's a there's a term that is called the the, the rule of threes. Uh, when I was at the National Fire Academy here in the United States, uh, they they use a terminology called the rule of threes. It's a very simple um, way of of looking at the operation and 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 kind of getting our handle on what's really going on. And the first question is a very simple question. It's what do I have? Or what, what's happened here? Do I have a fire? Do I have a, a collapse, a pre-collapse of a, of, of, a, of a structural um, uh, event here? Do I have something else going on? The second thing is, where is it going? 
if I don't interact with that structure, if I don't uh, do some uh, progressive operations within that event, will it expand or will it get uh, stay the same? What, what's going to happen with, when I don't do something for this building? So where is it going? Will it expand or contract? And lastly, how do I manage it? What resources do I need to make this incident go away, to come to a, a safe conclusion? Now, we may look at this as very simplistic, but I would, I would uh, challenge all fire commanders that, that 95%, 99% perhaps, of the events that you go to, if you ask these questions and in, in just in your, in your mental uh, hard drive that you're spinning to see what you need to, to, to affect it, a positive effect on this fire. What do I have? Where is it going? And how do I manage it? If you ask those three questions, then uh, many times you'll have the answer of what you have to in engage in this firefighting operation. So there's a command sequence that we want to be con concerned about or consider, and that's understanding the situation, asking those three questions. What do I have? Where is it going? And what do I need? Establishing incident objectives. What do I want to do at this particular fire? What's my strategy here? Do I want to put the fire out? Do I want to rescue the, the victims? Do I want to do that all simultaneously? Do I want to protect just exposures, meaning that the fire building itself is so badly involved and there's so much damage to this fire and the internal components of the fire of, of the building? Do I want to just let this fire kind of cease itself, protect around the building, protect the exposures? Is that the strategy that I want to develop for this particular uh, operation? I want to also direct tactical assignments. Tactical assignments are telling our folks what to do, but not how to do them. If you have a well-trained company of, of firefighters and you tell them, I want you to ladder the building, then that's about all you need to do. You might want to say, I want to ladder the building on the right side or uh, for the peak to the peak of this fire or, or something of that nature. But typically, if you have a well-trained, well-operating company of firefighters, you can simply say, I want to ladder the building, or I want to stretch some hoses to the front door. I want to make an internal uh, entry with some hose lines. Uh, and that's about all you need to do if you have a well-trained, uh, capable uh, company of firefighters. And then you want to implement the plan. And then on a regular basis, about every 10 minutes, you want to evaluate the plan. Is it working well? Is it something that I'm doing or that my company is doing that's not causing this fire to go down as quickly as I, as, as I imagine it should be or I calculate it, it should be? So you want to evaluate your plan about every 10 minutes. We want to talk a little bit about uh, responder uh, scene safety. That's very critical, very important to our, to our operations. And so the first thing we want to look at is the incident safety officer should be assigned to most incidents. Now, some departments uh, probably have incident safety officers already uh, in, their, in their cadre of, of, of firefighters. And there might be some departments that do not have incident safety officers. But in a, a very large proportion of the fires that you go to, you should have an incident safety officer assigned. Now, who is the incident safety officer? Let's say you don't have a formal uh, ISO or incident safety officer program. Well, the typical ISO that you would want to uh, assign would be the most experienced or an experienced person or someone who's certified in the safety officer genre. Uh, those are the people that you want to identify as the incident safety officer. Now, what does the safety officer do? He is the eyes and ears or she is the eyes and ears of your operation. So if you're standing at the front of the building and you're watching your operation, you're watching your firefighters stretch hose, throw ladders, uh, bring in more operational uh, pieces of equipment and uh, transferring water and so forth, then that safety officer may be uh, rotating around the building or the structure or the complex and just making sure that all the operations that you've asked to be uh, placed into operation are being done safely. Do they have opposing uh, uh, hand lines? Are they spraying water towards each other? Is there an opportunity that the incident safety officer sees for maybe some structural parts of the, of the building to, to fall and to impede operations or to hurt firefighters or, or civilians. So that incident safety officer will work directly for you, the incident commander, and he or she has the uh, ability and, and the, the right to stop or change oper operational actions. So if you have an ISO, an incident safety officer who's 
who's on the backside and they see uh, some firefighters unsafely uh, 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 holding or bracing or as I call butting the ladder, they can stop that operation and say, you know, locate that a little more firmly there, get it on the ground a little firmly and then, and then lift it properly or raise it properly. They can stop or change that operation. What I would advise you to do if you, if you assign safety officers to make sure that that ISO speaks to you uh, as quickly as he or she can once they've stopped and changed an operation so that you know what's going on and so that you know that everyone is in sync with your operational command. So we talked about establishing objectives. They need to be attainable, measurable, and flexible. Now attainable is can your, can your firefighters uh, do the operation that, that you want them to, to complete? Is it measurable, meaning every 10 minutes, every five minutes, or are they uh, um, you know, making headway into the fire? And, and this objective needs to be flexible and broad. As we know, fires uh, kind of do their own thing, uh, left without any kind of external impact on it. So we need to be flexible when we set up our, our objectives when we uh, de de uh, delegate our, our operations to our folks. Uh, we want to identify the strategy. Uh, I'll just very quickly, the IC's responsibility is to determine what needs to be done and communicate. That's the key word there, communicate. If, as long as we can keep those lines of communication open to all of our uh, fire ground uh, folks, then usually the, the strategy is, is in play uh, as confidently as we, as we expect. The strategy, is it rescue evacuation? Is it exposure protection? The questions that you see there, um, we, we identify the strategy. What do we want to do at this at this incident? Do we want to rescue? Do we want to fight the fire? Do we want to ventilate? Do we want to do many of these operations in simultaneous uh, complexity with each other uh, at the towards the end of the fire? Do we want to overhaul the fire, meaning we want to make sure there's no fire in the in the walls or in other parts of the structure? Uh, if the fire is is such that we can salvage some of the internal parts of the fire, what's inside of the occupancy there, whether it's furniture or uh, goods and, and uh, things that, that maybe the shop owner, if we can save that or salvage that, that'd be very helpful to that operation there as well. Realistic tactics employed by firefighters should match the strategies. So if you tell your firefighters, we're going to fight this fire, we're going to apply water to it, we're going to extinguish the fire, then that's your tactical direction when you say, I want to stretch hose lines, into the, into the fire itself, or I want to ladder the building, or I want to ventilate the structure. Uh, they need to match up with the strategy that, you, that you've uh, told your, your firefighters you want to operate under. Uh, uh, sometimes catastrophic events occur. We have maybe a smoke explosion, or we have a flashover. We have a collapse of that structure. And so we want to be, be prepared for that. We talked about a collapse zone earlier. That collapse zone is one and a half times the height of the building. Now, sometimes you can't move your, you can't place your, your equipment 60 feet away from the fire or 100 feet away from the fire based upon the height of the building. So whatever you can do to minimize uh, structural or, or damage to your, to your, to your equipment and, and danger to your people, uh, I, would, I would consider that when we place your equipment. Maybe we place it at the corners of the structure, uh, either past the, the, the fire building or before the, before the fire building so that if the real collapse does occur, it collapses out onto the street and not onto us. Uh, so we clearly communicate our assignments. Uh, many times that might be face-to-face, -face, which I like face-to-face -face communications if that's, if that's able to, do, to be done. Because uh, you can see uh, body language and body motions of the people you're giving the, the commands to and, and them receiving and communicating back to you. Uh, make sure that the assignments are understood, um, be short and simple with your directions and obtain timely feedback. So your, your officers that are in the fire, in the interior of the fire, uh, you want them to timely feedback. If they have radio communications, that's great. If not, then they can send a runner, if, you, if they can uh, spare that, a runner back to the commander, to you and say, we're making good headway into this fire or we're seeing that the, that the seat of fire is just not going out, there's something else going on, or we're, we're seeing a lot of smoke in this area and we need to ventilate it. So this implementing these actions, communication is very critical there. As I mentioned, we wanna evaluate the plan. About every 10 minutes, uh, we wanna see if the scenes is changing, are we getting more fires, the fire being extinguished? 
Are we seeing the smoke uh, velocity and the smoke volume going down or is it, is it increasing? What is that telling us about what's going on with the fire? So is our strategy effective? And does the plan need to be modified so that we're making headway into this, to this event? <clears throat> You'll see a, a young uh, Chief Taco, I think, uh, I think Jose is still with us. So there's Jose. Um, you mentioned Chief Taco. That's that's me right here. As a young uh, incident commander, I was an EMS chief years and years ago. You notice we're still I'm still wearing my tie, so I'm able to uh, look uh, classy when I'm out there. And uh, Chief Mike and I talked a little bit before the uh, the uh, the class starting, talking about the structure of cars and how they are built so much better these days. Uh, this gentleman here is in pins. This is the the driver, and we're trying to take this car apart from around him. So uh, sometimes our incident failure causes are poor size up. Like I said at the very beginning, if we don't build a good size up, have a good size up of, of the event, and we don't have a good foundation for that structural event to make our command operations run smoothly and effectively, uh, then we can have a, a failure in that. If we have inadequate resources, if we don't call enough resources to the event, we keep bringing more and more because the fire is moving ahead uh, faster than we can, we can uh, eradicate it, then uh, that can be a cause for the failure on the scene. Poor communications, it's very important to communicate to our folks clearly and effectively and on a regular basis. Uh, oftentimes or sometimes catastrophic, event, catastrophic events occur and uh, we wanna try to foresee those. If we spin our mental hard drive and we see what's going on with this structure, then uh, sometimes we can kind of uh, conceive what might be happening with this, this particular event and uh, prevent it from causing any more damage to our, to our structure and or uh, danger to our folks. And sometimes poor operations. If our folks aren't up to speed, uh, if they're not trained well, or if they're not capable of, of, of uh, handling the, the uh, tactical assignments that you give, then sometimes poor operations may be a cause for a failure at the scene. Uh, that just tells us we need to train more and train better and uh, keep our folks on, on, a, on a very sharp edge of, of uh, their capabilities. So I mentioned earlier uh, a fire uh, that you saw on one of the earlier slides. And that was a, about a nine story building that had three sub floors or sub basements below us. And it was a block wide by block long. It was a uh, place that was originally made uh, printed magazines. But in later days, when I was the fire chief in a small town up in Ohio, which is in the central part of the, of the United States, um, this became a, a warehouse. And they, they, they kept everything from motorcycle helmets to five gallon buckets of can hard candy. It was just a, a, a maze in there. And the reason it became so problematic is because we were not allowed in there because of a lawsuit of the owner. So the only time we got to see this building was when it was on fire. Uh, this was an 18 uh, hour fire. We, we pumped about 2 million gallons of water. Uh, and this was uh, an event that had all kinds of uh, things going on. We had uh, a fight of uh, some of our folks and they had so many been um, put into the fire so many times to extinguish the fire that uh, they had just mentally had, uh, had issues and there were some fights and uh, we had some firefighters that got hurt, none seriously. But uh, this is uh, an incident commander's nightmare. But what I would say to you is, if you do a size up upon your arrival, if you have any knowledge of building construction, if you uh, provide a good tactical directions and you have a, a well-based strategy, then uh, most of these events can be, can be controlled. As I said, this was an 18 hour fire for us. Actually, the entire time was about 24 hours after we put the fire out, we had to go in there and sell, not salvage, but overhaul a lot of operations here. We brought in uh, our one department, which had about 127 firefighters. The problem we had there was we didn't have enough flashlights. Now that may sound kind of simple, but uh, when you're in there operating and the electrical system has been shut down, uh, you need a lot of flashlights. And so we sent our emergency manager for the town over to a local store, a Walmart, you might be familiar with Walmart. And uh, he was able to borrow, and I use that, that term loosely, borrow, about 500 flashlights and battery sets there that we could use. So you have to kind of make up these, uh, these, these plans on the, on the fly sometimes, but uh, this was a successful fire uh, in the event that uh, when it occurred. 
Oops, let's see. Can we get this to move forward? There we go. So some guidelines for warriors. And yeah, let me see if I can, there we go. If a tactic is not, warring, is not working, change it. It's not gonna get better. So one of the truisms that I would say is, if you have a tactic that you're, that you're directing your firefighters to operate within, it's just not working, change it. May have a plan B there because uh, it's not gonna get any better. No matter how good your plan is, have a backup plan. Uh, fires don't read your memos. Fires don't know uh, what your capabilities are. It just continu continues to consume uh, product. So uh, your plan may not work. And if it's not, have a, have a backup plan, especially if you have a collapse or a structural collapse, or if you have a firefighter that's injured, uh, make sure you have a backup plan that can, that can accommodate that, that eventuality. Don't, tr don't trust escaping occupants who tell you everybody's out of the building. Uh, sometimes in their, in, their, in their excitement or their, their uh, need to get out of the building, they may miss someone, an occupant in there, uh, a family member perhaps. Uh, so don't, don't always trust people that come out of the building and say, everyone's out of the building. You have to, uh, if, you, if you can, if you have the capabilities to make an interior search of the building and a secondary search, then uh, I would advise to, to do that uh, at, at your events. If you have time to deploy a primary line, uh, fire line, uh, hose line, then you have time to lay a backup. If you if you have the hose loads uh, loaded in your engine properly, then you can uh, you can do your primary and your backup line uh, as well. If you have firefighters, if you don't need all your firefighters at the scene, the fire is starting to, to drop down and you've got uh, plenty of water going on, make sure the firefighters that not that are not involved in, in uh, ongoing operations. Put them in a staging area, let them rehab, put them in a staging area, but control them. Make sure they're not wandering around. Make sure they're not at the back of the building trying to figure out what's going on or trying to make entry to see what's inside the building, whatever. Freelancing firefighters are firefighters that have a potentiality of, of getting seriously injured or killed. So as a, as a strong incident commander, uh, you, would, you could prevent that or you should prevent that. If you have firefighters that or, or volunteers in your department that may be they can't firefight anymore. Maybe they're they're because of age, or maybe an injury, or for whatever reason. Those are great people that you can train as aides, and they can do a multitude of things. If you have one just one radio, they can operate the radio between dispatch. If you have a dispatch center and you, uh, they can make notations of where all your firefighters are. Uh, they can make notations of where the building is and kind of lay lay it out in a in a, in a, a kind of a, a, a written a grammatic. Uh, a, graphic uh, on, a, on a board or a screen. Uh, a good aid is indispensable if they're trained properly. And I would, I would strongly suggest we use one. Uh, I had uh, one when I was a, 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 a battalion chief in, uh, in Central Florida, and uh, he was a, an absolute um, blessing to have with me. He kept a lot of things straight that uh, when you get six or seven people calling you at the same time, he could kind of keep that radio traffic uh, smoothed down. The better your SOPs, your standard operating procedures are, the, the better they are, and the more you, en you enforce them, the less chance you have to make a decision on the fly or make up a policy on the fly. Uh, many times, if you don't have an SOP or the SOP has not been updated or it's not proper, then this may lead to a failure, failure on the scene. If you have entrapments, uh, there, hopefully you have uh, uh, some way uh, your folks telling you if they're entrapped, if they're stuck or lost, to tell you what's going on, and if they have a capability of communicating with you. And one way of doing it is a mnemonic that's called LUNAR, which stands for the location. Where are they located? What's, what unit? In other words, who, who, who's talking to you? What's their name? How much air do they have if they're using air, air tanks? and what resources are needed. We have someone inside who's, who's been injured. We need a stretcher. We need someone to come in with some tools to, uh, to, to save me. I've been entrapped, what have you. So develop a responder entrapment signal that you might be able to use in your, in your operation. Um, the next one is face-to-face -face communication. I mentioned that several times. I like face-to-face -face communications if, if, uh, if you can do that on the fire scene. It's much more effective than radio traffic especially if you have spotty radio traffic that's not, not very clear. And if you're the leader lead, uh, if you're a strong leader, then, then bring out all your tools, open your toolbox and lead properly, lead strongly. If you're, if you're kind of apprehensive, then uh, you know, training like this and, and go on YouTube and, and watch videos of fires and 
kind of spin your hard drive and see what's going on there. So the next time you lead your men and women, you do it very strongly and very, very emphatically. Tell your people what to do, but not how to do it. If they're well-trained and they're competent, then all you have to say is, I want you to ladder the building at X, Y location. I want you to pull the line to this location, et cetera. So tell them what to do, but, but not how to do it. Okay, so that is kind of the uh, nuts and bolts of the presentation today or the lesson today. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. And seeing none or hearing none, let me do this. First of all, I wanna thank everyone that, that's attended today. Uh, Chief Mike, it was great seeing you again. Uh, Jose, as always, it's, it's, it's great to see you. I'm glad to see you're still in, in, the, in the game. Uh, again, my name is Frank Montes de Oca. I'm a retired fire chief from the Central Florida area. If you wanna get a hold of me directly, that's my email account down there, frm1 at me.com. And I think Jose has gone on this, uh, this site before. It's responder1.org. Uh, this presentation, Mike, uh, I'll send you this updated presentation so that that'll be the right one on, on the AFM uh, site. But there's some more information uh, on responder1.org. This presentation will be there, but there's also some other things. Uh, there's a, a book on, on a, a task book that you can sign off your folks on different tasks or ropes, knots. Uh, ladders, etc. So anyway, uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to talk with everyone in uh, Africa. I appreciate the time. And uh, Chief Mike, is there anything else I need to cover? No, that's pretty good, Chief. We'll, uh, we'll uh, hang on for just a couple more minutes here with the official class. If anybody has a question, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, you can unmute yourselves now. Um, and we'll take a, a couple questions directly related to our class today. Delino, go ahead. I see your hand up. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Monte. How are you, sir? Very good, thank you. How are you? <clears throat> I'm doing well. I'm doing fine, sir. I'm doing fine. Uh, I've, I've got a concern about with the uh, incident commanders that when you reach uh, in the MVA, Mm -hmm. And then instead of uh, commanding the scene, they end up holding uh, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the line, the, the injection line, what yes. do they call it? And I then it's the IV, IV line. Yes, yes. So it's, it's like you end up, uh, the, the incident commander end up uh, losing focus because his focus will be on the IV line and then not, not on the scene. Absolutely. And then a uh, firefighter will end up knowing, uh, having a lot of things to do and then getting injuries, but because of the incident commander, there won't yeah. be any safety for the firefighters. That, that's an excellent, uh, excellent point you make. The, the picture that I showed you, in, in that, particular, that particular incident, uh, that, that incident commander, which was not me, uh, I, was, I was in charge of patient care. Uh, as, a, as a paramedic, I was the only one there that was uh, helping the other paramedic to do that. Uh, in, in some occasions, you'll see that there are multiple commanders, and I use that term loosely. There can only be one incident commander, the one who is in charge of the entire operation. Now, there may be other... Uh, operations going on that may not be affect uh, the, the firefighting. It may be simply uh, they're doing patient care or they may be doing patient rescue. So the point you make is 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 very, very good that you need to be as the in, the incident commander, the one incident commander needs to kind of step back of that operation so he can get a big picture of what's going on and make sure all operations are being done competently and safely. That's a good point you make. Thank you, sir. Uh, Your hand is up. Go ahead. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Peter Maina. Mm -hmm. I'm the CEO and founder of the organization known as Africa Disaster Management. Mm -hmm. And mine is first to appreciate each and every one of us. 
because uh, at least for me, what I have heard and what I have seen uh, Mr. Montez uh, doing, eh, mm -hmm. these have always been my prayer here in Kenya that uh, because uh, we have been uh, not been taking serious our fire issues here. And uh, I myself, being that I have been trained in uh, in Dubai Police Academy, I was trained on the high field. I have been trained all these. So these are some of the things I have been uh, asking myself. Don't we uh, can we get a team that we can come here in Kenya and train and creating awareness on all this? Since our fire, our country has become a victim of these fires. Yes. So. I, uh, I just want to, because I have also planned, I myself starting next month, I have uh, that program that I'm starting, that I'll be going all the 47 counties, creating uh, awareness on fire, safety, all the training, and I'll be issuing uh, the certificate. So I feel I'm very good for you people, what you have started. I have not been able to join this group. I was just added the, the other day when someone saw what I've been doing. So I appreciate you, Tim, and all the readers, and hoping that this will continue for more and more to our people. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Uh, uh, I, I am simply an instructor in this. Uh, Chief Mike uh, is, is the project manager, and I'm sure he can share some more information as well as Jose. Um, my my you know, congratulations to you and your efforts. Um, you know, fire prevention and emergency uh, uh, care is is tantamount is is a very important throughout the communities throughout our world so what you're doing is is commendable and i, I thank you for that chief mike uh, or jose do you have any uh, other thoughts or comments to to peter yeah um i'd say peter thank you so much that's uh, really commendable with what you're doing uh i'll drop my email and then we can have uh a conversation on um, on what you're doing. And uh, yeah, for us as Africa Fire Mission, we offer support and um, we complement uh, what you're doing. So I would I'd drop my email. In fact, right now at the chat, you can just uh, grab it. And then um, later on, we could uh, catch up later on on the side. So I'd invite also Hesbon or Viambo, your hand is up. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, good afternoon, guys. I hope I'm audible enough. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Frank, for that wonderful presentation. Very clear, short and precise and on the point. Thank you, Mike. Once again, we meet uh, for the second time. Um, it's, it's nice being with you here again. And uh, this very important uh, um, topic uh, for me at, uh, by the way, for the benefit of Frank, um, I, my name is Hesbon. I work for the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. I am in charge of the emergency operation centers. I'm the coordinator for uh, about nine uh, operation centers across the country. So um, this is a very good topic for me because, uh, again, it's uh, one of the biggest headaches for me also <laughs> as, a, as an EOC coordinator because not everybody <laughs> understands incident command system. And if you look at it, um, we have a very big challenge in terms of uh, people sitting down and uh, studying or training on the incident command system vis-a-vis -vis going to the field and actually practicing the incident command system itself. So those are two different things that here in Kenya, it's normally a very big problem. And uh, Jose will tell you that whenever we have had an incident that has happened, then uh, all the, the incident command system itself goes out the window. And uh, we end up doing what we know how to do best. Uh, but now we also have the National Disaster Management Unit who come in to, you know, to, to put us in line sometimes. But uh, there's this thing that has really been um, bothering me individually, personally. That is, I, I don't know how, uh, or maybe what AFM has been doing about it. Jose, I don't know if you've been doing something about this. You know that one of our greatest headaches here is um, communication, and it was one of your, your it was in one of your slides whereby interagency. Yeah. Uh, uh, communication, you know, like um, we can only communicate via mobile phones, but but you see, I know like in, in, in the US or in the States, I know there's this unified communication system whereby it goes 911, we have uh, mm -hmm. the ambulance services, we can all hear the radio chatter whenever we have an incident, isn't it? 
Yes. I, I don't know, Jose, what, what if there is there's anything that has started, uh, uh, because I, I feel like here in Kenya, we need to have that kind of a unified uh, communication system whereby uh, we can directly communicate with the uh, different agencies, even as they're responding, they can subscribe to that. So this is one area that I feel uh, we should be able to uh, to, we should be able to, to, to support. The other thing is uh, we have quite a number and uh, I don't know how we do this. Again, I'll, I'll just speak to Jose because based on context. Uh, so I, I don't mm -hmm. know what we'll do about this because uh, one of the things that I've, I've come to realize is we are having so many trainers on, 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 on this such that uh, we don't have a general, you know, like the way you talk about FEMA, um, where you yeah. have a standardized, uh, standardized training. But this one, I've found that uh, I've gone to different counties and um, I'll give an example of the fire brigades. Uh, forgive me for this. I've, I've, when I go to Taita Taveta and I'm talking to the fire brigade team, the understanding of instant command system is different. When you go to Kisumu, I talk to the, the team there, the understanding is different. And, and, and this is really diluting what we have in general. So I don't know, Jose, how we are going to go about this because uh, mm. when, when people call in here, we are telling them something, it's, it's, it's again, another story altogether. Yeah. Secondly, I would I, I don't know if these are proposals also uh, in terms of uh, I know Jose you've been doing a lot of uh, community awareness and just yesterday there was a fire about a, a, an LPG gas isn't it somewhere in uh, yeah. Kayaba or something like that. Kayaba. So mm. it's like things are it's just repeating themselves again and again and then again uh, my, my colleague um, has also talked about uh, something to do with the incident commander not knowing what to do jumping from one side to one side not knowing that he needs to step aside so what you're saying is how about now we start taking uh, this awareness sessions uh, to the fire stations you know like now we start mm -hmm. bringing them to that direction whereby we make it deliberate that uh, we have a calendar of activities. I don't know if AFM has done it, but we make a calendar of activities to do instant command system, you know, some basic, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, street smart uh, strategies mm -hmm. mixed with the normal uh, SOPs, because mm -hmm. otherwise we will have all this um, that is going to be a bit difficult. Lastly, we also have, we have seen there's some stakeholders who are coming in with something called JESIP. I don't know if you've heard about it. JESIP. Joint, Jesse, no. Just you can Google it or something. J E S I. Okay. It's something that is, is also trained on the side. It's bringing something called methane. You know what methane is? Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're championing methane, mm -hmm. which is uh, diluting again what instant command system is. So again, it's confusing the market. It's confusing. Oh the guys because you find responders one responder comes to the field and they're talking about jesse the other one is talking about instant command system so these two things are also a challenge so i uh, sorry frank i this is just a mic this is a lot but i think it's it's good to just put it uh, <laughs> so that we can be able to just see even as we are delivering this because we have 50 plus participants then we can be able to clearly put things uh, i don't know we can support uh, jose thank you if I could, if I could just interject just for a second, <clears throat> um, I, remember going, I remember going to the National Fire Academy. My first time was in 1982. Y'all can do the math and figure out how long ago that was. And, and, and they started talking about a nationwide incident command system in 1982. And I will tell you today in the United States, although the incident command system is, is a nationwide process, which you know, gets pounded in our head and, and, and we kind of know it in our sleep, there are still pockets of resistance, even on the west side of the country, where they kind of do their own thing out in the wild, wild west, as we call it. So it's commendable of, of what everyone is doing in, in Africa and, and, and what you're trying to do to standardize the process. And I'm not trying to, 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 uh, to rain on the parade and say, well, it's going to take you 50 years, which I hope it doesn't. But what I would say is, just keep keep pounding away at it. Keep keep sending the message. Make sure the the message is standardized, and and it, and it will it will succeed. It will it will be a, a, a positive event. But it has it has taken us uh, close to fifty years to get everyone on the same page. And uh, I would I would commend everyone who's who's doing this and trying to make that uh, a standardized process in in Africa. Jose. Yeah, thank you so much, Frank. Those are, I can imagine, 1982. And uh, 
the proper time, it was really, I remember uh, getting to see ICS in action was uh, during the 9-11, uh, after the 9-11 incident, yes. which was uh, <clears throat> quite some many years later. So before I make my comments, uh, Chief Mike, maybe we'd uh, stop the class and then we'll just overflow to the to the Q&A to the tea time. What do you think, sir? Yes, sounds good. Thanks, everybody, for coming out today, for joining us for today's class. We appreciate all of you coming. Special thanks to Chief Frank for his expertise coming and spending time with us uh, out of his busy schedule. Next week, I encourage everyone to join us. We've got a uh, local presenter. Oliver is going to be presenting yes. about developing company drills. So please, everyone, uh, thank you and join us next week.